What up, gum fighters? You ever have one of those nights that turn into the next day where you just can't sleep? Uh, your dog wakes you up to go to the bathroom, then wakes you up because out of water, and then it's time for your wife to wake up, and before you know it, it's the next day. Well, here we are. <laughs> Care or don't, a uh, little bit of my life story there. But uh, first world problems. I'm a blessed man. No worries. Today on Gunfighter Life, where we talk about guns and gunfighting the right way, Judeo-Christian values, and real-world first-hand experience. Let's talk about some ammunition myths. So we're going to talk about today, ammunition myths on Gunfighter Life. No bio, no nothing like that. If this is your first rodeo, you can look up a bio other places. <coughs> Check out GoodShepherdTraining.com. But let's get into it. Numero uno. That's uh, Spanish for number one. <laughs> I'm tired, guys. <clears throat> the show must go on, as they say. Numero uno. With a shotgun, and I love the shotgun, I can just point in the general direction. And, and the threat will just disappear in a pile of soon-to-be human jello no no that's a myth you have to aim a shotgun i'll tell you a story that illustrates this well in lapd we learned to do hostage shots with a shotgun with buckshot yeah that was part of our training hostage shots with buckshot with a shotgun i'm talking 870 I'm talking, it was either 8 or 9 pellet. I don't honestly remember. Probably flight control. Double O buck. And do you know why? Because at close distances, we're talking like inside a room distances, unless you're talking about you know, a basketball stadium sized room. Inside normal rooms, it's very tight. You're talking like fist sized groups. Right? You get a little bit more margin of error. Instead of margin of error. Instead of it being like 1.355 diameter bullet as in 9mm, you get a bunch and they're in a cluster, but they're still pretty close together at close distances. The distances you're probably going to use a shotgun for most of your defensive use. So if you think you don't have to aim, actually go out to the range and try that out. If you're the person telling somebody else to just get a shotgun because you just point in the general direction, um, no. No. Sorry to bust your bubble. That is a myth. I don't care what choke you have. Doesn't really matter. I don't care. It doesn't really matter at distance. Barrel length, choke. If, as long as you're using a good defensive load, the load, you still got to aim. <laughs> you still got to aim. Plus, you'd be violating your safety rule, right? Keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are aligned on the target. How would you know if you're not aiming? <clears throat> bad, bad philosophy there. Moving on. Oh, this ammunition is close enough. Like, oh, you know, let's take a... I'm shooting 55 grain Winchester white box. I'm shooting that for practice in my AR, but I'm going to load it up with these really cool whiz-bang Hornady tap rounds or, you know, Spear gold dot, 55 grain. And they're 55 grain. I mean, they even got the same velocity printed on the box. It's close enough. Is it? Is it close enough? There are so many things that play into the symphony that have to work together to achieve the beautiful music that is accuracy. So much more than just, oh, it's the same caliber and the same bullet grain weight. Is it the same primer? Is it the same powder? Is it the same seating depth? Is it the same amount of freeboard to your rifling? <laughs> There's, is it the same case thickness? There's all kinds of stuff. Close enough? Really? Is it close enough? Just because it's a 55 grain, it can shoot wildly different. and It may. And I like to test that out, and I like to find something that shoots the same. Like, you know, I like, and this isn't my rifle. This may not apply to your rifle, so don't think this applies to you. You have to test this when fired by you. But 
like for instance in days of your one of my go-to fighting rifles I would like to practice with federal 55 grain American Eagle full metal jacket and my go-to defensive load for a long time was federal 55 grain true tactical rifle urban and that worked out pretty well for me out of my gun but there's a lot of different 55 grain bullets there's boat tails there's flat base bullets there's again different kinds of primers especially if you're going manufacturer to manufacturer different brass like there's so again so much that goes into that accuracy the one of the big keys to the accuracy is consistency you're literally not consistent if you're going from one load to another so close enough same with the hunting world now if you get I don't want to get too wrapped up around this if you were a hand loader you're probably pretty judicious about this but even if you're like a target competition shooter you can even get into if you're buying factory ammo making sure it's the same lot number because stuff can differ from lot number to lot number right and I'm not saying you have to be that as much of a stickler about it unless the ammunition was manufactured like years apart like you found the box of 223 from the from the 80s in extra Remington UMC it's pro it's likely they may have changed the powder or primer combination by then and maybe then but if you're like long-range target shooting just to prove a point like those guys will pay attention to what lot number it is because things can change from lot number to lot number so close enough is it really if you have not tested it then you don't know if it's close enough you have no idea your point of aim point of impact you're just hoping and hope is a good thing, but when you can test your ballistics, it's good to have good quantifiable data that, that shoots the same point of aim, point of impact. So, you know, don't just assume. You know, they've been making, for example, for like hunters, they've been making what is, let's say, what a, what's a classic, uh, let's say 30 out 6. 150 grain Remington Corlock, deer slaying load, been that way for decades. You think it's possible they changed some things in that recipe from, I don't know, the 80s, whenever that load came out, to the ones you buy on the shelf today in 2023? Right? So even if, again, close enough, is it? Is it close enough? Again, you don't know unless you test it. You should test it. Another big one, and this is for rifles, always want a hollow point. Hollow point. Hollow points, maybe, depending on the rifle load. Depending on another load, you may not. And I think a lot of this comes from handgun, and usually you want a hollow point in a handgun. Uh, the vast majority of times for a self-defense situation. But for a rifle, for defense or hunting, you may not want a hollow point. You may want a soft pointed bullet or a polymer tipped bullet, or I think Nosler owns the name ballistic tip, but you're dealing with much greater velocities. If you're talking about a standard 9mm round, you're talking depending on the grain weight, just under or just over 1,000 feet a second, maybe up to 1,200 if you're really cooking. If you're talking a rifle round, let's just for round number 2,800, Let's round it up to 3,000 for rough numbers, three times the velocity. You're dealing with different numbers. You're dealing with different... What is the word I am searching for here? You are looking at much different terminal ballistics and much different expansion rates on a projectile going that much faster, several times faster. There are some some decent, you know, defensive hollow point rifle loads or good hunting hollow point rifle loads, but not always. A lot a lot of hollow point loads for many rifles are match ammunition, and match ammunition is fine for match shooting. Maybe not what you want for a deer. Just because it says hollow point doesn't mean it was designed to expand. Case in point, there's a lot of like wolf and tula ammo that's quote unquote hollow point. The point may be hollow, but if you're banking on that to expand, I'd find another bank. A lot of times in a rifle, a soft point is what you want. It's just a simple soft lead point because it balances that expansion versus penetration ratio. It's an inverse relationship, and you got to find that balance for your intended target. It, it may be a hollow point for you. It may be 
a soft plant, maybe a ballistic tip. If you're talking about defense, unless you have some really good reason like barrier penetration or something, it's probably not a green tip or a full metal jacket. But don't just assume, oh, it's a hollow point. It says hollow point, so it must be good. Like if it's a Tula hollow point, probably not. If it's a match hollow point, it might be accurate, but that doesn't mean it's going to give you the intended terminal performance just because it has a hollow point. If you think it's good defensive ammo because it says hollow point, you're probably missing the point. Another one. Let's talk about some, I think, things that get marketed. Okay. Boat tail. The boat tail bullet. It's got to be better. It says boat tail. It doesn't just say FMJ. It says FMJ boat tail. FMJ BT. It's got more letters. It must be better for me. Or it says, doesn't just say hollow point. It says hollow point boat tail. BT. Hollow point boat tail. So it must be better. Right. I want that boat tail. Do you? Do you know why there is a boat tail? Do you, do you want a boat tail? A lot of times, unless you're shooting really long range, you may not want a boat tail. Now, I never, I've never i done a lot of competition shooting. I have never done bench rest. But as I understand, a lot of people in bench rest that go for absolute accuracy, like a flat base bullet. And I found just in my own shooting that a lot of times I like a flat based bullet. Because the powder and everything pushes squarely on the back of that. It's, it's a more abrupt and hopefully uniform surface for that gas pressure to push on than a boat tail. The boat tail is a better design, quote unquote better, if you're shooting really long range, it makes it more aerodynamic. That's why boats are shaped that way. That's hydrodynamics, but the medium might be different, but the principle is the same. But if you're shooting inside what I would say conservative ranges, 300 yards and in, I'd say that doesn't really apply to you, and I I could care less one way or the other. Now, I'd say what's really important is shoot different loads out of your rifle, whichever one it likes, go with. But if my gun likes a flat base bullet better, and it very well may, I- I'm not going to get a boat tail because it's a boat tail. Boat tail is not always better. It can be, especially if you're shooting long range. The same with ballistics coefficient. That gets thrown around a lot. Now, that's the buzzword of of like the new ballistics, the new gun culture 2.0. And I've, I've got a lot of good things to say about gun culture 2.0. But you hear this BC, BC, ballistics coefficient, man. It's got to have a high BC. It gets thrown around like Synergy does in boardrooms. Like, do you want Synergy? Do you want everybody to agree? Not if it's wrong, right? Then you want disagreement. So you have dissenting opinions. If everything else is equal, then yeah, sure, give me more BC. Throw some BC numbers on there. Crank it up a notch. But I wouldn't give up like a worse accuracy or, or especially for hunting or defense, especially defense, I would not give up good terminal performance for high ballistics coefficient. Right? That's what does the killing is the projectile. You can have a really good high BC bullet. Like we're talking about a really good match bullet with a really high BC that says hollow point. That is horrible for your choice of game. Just it's designed to hit a steel plate at a thousand yards. Terminal performance is an afterthought for that. Maybe not what you want to shoot your elk with. And I see this with a lot of a lot of new calibers, like a lot of the like and there's nothing wrong with these calibers. I really like and do a lot of hunting with a six five Creedmoor. Like six five Creedmoor, six five PRC, pretty much anything that says PRC, and a lot of that is designed for match shooting. Six millimeter Creedmoor, anything with Creedmoor or PRC in the name, something like that. And they're not bad calibers, don't get me wrong. But a lot of those are designed for long-range competition match shooting. And that's fine. It's not a fault of the manufacturer. It's not a fault of the bullet. It's a fault of you. It's a fault of you for not doing your homework, for doing your research. I got no problem slaying a beast and eating it, and I don't apologize for that. But we're called to be good stewards. I think it's your responsibility to do a little bit of research on what you're going to shove into an animal to kill it. And get the best tool for the job that's humane. Those bullets, many of them, were designed for mat shooting. For ringing steel. For punching small groups in paper. For long range stuff. Right? 
If you want a good terminal performing bullet, unless it just happens to be a coincidence, get one designed for good terminal performance on your intended target. Like going back to that old Remington core lock load, right? I take a good Remington core lock load with very mild BCs, very pedestrian BCs per today's standards, over a really high BC super long range match hollow point bullet for most hunting that I do because... The terminal performance is important, right? More important to most people in most situations probably than ballistics coefficient. If you're talking about defense and hunting, if you're talking about target shooting and long range, then yeah, BC is where it's at. But don't give in to the marketing and I guess weigh what's important to you. Because again, conservative distances inside 300 yards, you know the difference between most modern Spitzer bullets, even a flat-based bullet, And a really, really high BC match hollow point bullet inside 300 yards, the difference is going to be academic. But it may not be academic on the intended target. So, again. And I'm really glad that we have a lot of these new options and we have high BC bullets available. But do your due diligence. Newer or more is not always better. Here's another one. And I don't know if this is actually a saying that people say, but it's the way I kind of think that some people think about this. Solid copper bullets are for hippies in California hunting in hemp hoodies and wearing sandals. Not so. Although I am not for the mandating of solid copper bullets, monolithic bullets, monometal bullets, choose your vernacular. I'm not for the mandating of that per regulation. However, they can be phenomenally good bullets whether you're talking about for defense or for hunting. They can give really phenomenal, really phenomenal terminal performance. They punch above their weight class. So if you are using a marginal caliber for the intended situation, I would really, whether you're mandated to or not, give a good hard look, and not just in that situation, but I would give a good hard look to solid copper bullets. For instance, I would never... Say, like, I'm, I've am i been a professional big game hunter and guide. If you said you wanted to hunt deer with me with a 223, I would say, do you have anything else? Do you have a 3030? Do you have a 243? You're like, no, I am, I am set on, and I know what I'm doing, and I'm set on hunting with a 223. Now, first of all, you're going to have to demonstrate by shooting in front of me that you actually do know what you're doing. But assuming that, I would really steer you towards solid copper bullets if you were going to hunt here with a 223 right again i think it's a good idea now survival situation whether you're going to die if you don't eat or something that's different you use what you got but if you were going out to hunt deer maybe get a really good bullet and maybe in like a 223 for deer hunting you look at the solid copper i'm not saying they're the only but they're probably one of your best choices in 223 for deer hunting. And that's not the only situation. In many situations, those solid coppers are really, really good. If you said, I want to hunt deer with a 6.5 Creedmoor. Again, I again I like marginal caliber for that. I would say if you're going to use one of those hollow point match bullets, bad idea. If you're really diligent and get a good solid copper bullet, okay, now we're talking. If you can shoot and you keep your range conservative and you limit it to you know, very conservative shot angles, yeah, okay. I'm with you. And solid coppers kind of play by their own rules. They, again, kind of punch above their weight class, I think, for caliber and for grain weight. I shouldn't say, obviously. uh, I don't want to assume. But copper is lighter than lead. It's just the way it is. So your common cup and core bullet that is mostly lead with a copper coating or a copper jacket, that's going to be heavier, all other things being equal, than the solid copper because copper is lighter than lead. So they're generally going to be lighter, but that doesn't mean they're worse at terminal performance. In general, if you got two cup and core bullets, lead with a copper jacket, the heavier one in general you'll think will do a little bit better, and that's not always true. But if you're comparing like a copper, like let's say a real common loading 308, 150 grain, it's kind of your classic deer load. Well, don't think that 130 grain TSX or TTSX and 130 grain is less than or less terminal performance than 150 grain because it's just not so. In fact, I used to a long, long time ago, 
I started loading those 130 grains for a 308. And if you look at the ballistics on that and you look at the terminal performance on that, that's a good load. Now, I'd go up to something a little bit heavier depending on the game, the quarry that I was spot and stalking or whatever I was doing, but you get the idea. They kind of play by their own rules. So, again, don't just think that solid copper bullets are for places where it's mandated. I'm not saying you have to use copper. I'm not saying it's always the best option. Like, I wouldn't want to shoot solid coppers for prairie dogs because they're expensive, right? usually shooting over caliber for that. If I'm like hunting prey dogs with a 223, I don't think I need a solid copper for that. But don't think that solid copper bullets are only for places where they're mandated. They may be the best choice for you. They tend to penetrate really well and have really good terminal performance if the velocities are high enough. Well, how do you know if they're high enough? Well, do your due diligence. I'm not saying you got to run out and buy a chronograph, but Look at what the manufacturer says, like on a TSX. What's the expansion threshold for that? Then look at your gun with your barrel length. What, What's the likely velocity you're going to get? And round to be conservative. You could probably find all this data. And then how likely are you to shoot? For most hunters, it's inside 100 yards. But let's say you're going to push it out a couple hundred yards. Is your bullet still going to be above expansion threshold at that distance? Check. Check. All right. We're ready to rock and roll. Not that hard. You could probably do that you know, on your search engine of choice in a couple of minutes. And that might save you a lot of tracking time and trying to find a blood trail late at night when you're freezing. So again, do that homework. Here is another big one. And again, people I don't think actually say this, but I think it's the way that I kind of perceive it. The myth that deer are somehow now wearing body armor. Deer are somehow now getting steroids and juicing and hitting the gym. Right, The the deer that you were hunting is taxonomically the same as the deer that, you know, John Smith probably hunted when he landed here. Or that your granddad, if he hunted, if he was a hunter, hunted. Right, there's taxonomically really no different. There's actually, I think, more deer now than there were generations ago. We have a lot of deer here, thankfully, in the U.S. Done a, it's been a big blessing in the number of deer. A good, sustainable meat source for us humans, and that's a great blessing. But taxonomically, right, they're not any different. The calibers that were good at killing deer 50 years ago, there's not been a lot of advancement. I'm not into the super long range. Hunting, I I do like precision shooting. I cut my teeth on that. Um, I I love the romance of it. I love the precision of it. I think it's a worthwhile pursuit. I'm not that much into long-range hunting. If you are, I'm not here to tell you that's wrong. But if you're not into that, the calibers that were killing deer, again, 50 years ago, there's not been that much advancement. If you're talking about white-tailed mule deer, black-tailed deer, 243 is a deer-slaying machine if you do your part. And if you didn't kill it with a 243, it's probably your fault and not the caliber's fault. 243 is a lot for deer. A lot more than 223. Look at the numbers. Something like the good old 3030. Good at slaying deer 100 years ago, it's good for slaying deer tomorrow. Right? Don't think that the deer, again, started wearing body armor. They didn't. And even forgiven calibers are probably way better because the bullet technology is one of the big advancements. It's gotten better. Right, and if 243 is a good caliber, and I think it is one of my favorites for deer hunting, if 3030 is a good caliber, and I think it is, if 35 Remington is a good deer and black bear caliber, and I think it is, don't think that they're somehow outdated or obsolete or unworthy to take a deer with. Like I would take a 243 with a good game getting bonded bullet 100 grain for deer. Or something I know works, like one of my hand-loaded uh, 85 grain Sierra Game Kings over Varget for 243. I would take that load over a much more modern caliber with the, a match high BC, again, match hollow point bullet. Because, again, parameters. What what are the mission parameters? What are you trying to do? But deer are not out there wearing body armor. Another common misconception. And unless I think of another one. I am going to close on a big one. You've probably heard me talk about it before. Oh, it's a it's a 
it's one of mine for the handgun these all kind of play into each other maybe just kind of the myth that this is good defensive ammo it's going to work out of my defensive handgun maybe not how do you know Right, if you're talking about a fighting handgun, a gun that you may have to literally put your life on the line with, and not just you, but your family, the six-year-old girl that's at whatever place when some evil man tries to do an evil thing, the elderly lady, the whoever, their life might be on the line. And it might come down to, number one, Almighty God has it. He has plans. After that, your skill. Very, very, very important. But then it comes down to your gun and your ammo selection. Are you confident in it? Do you know that it's going to work? You just think it's going to work because it's got a really bright box. Maybe it's got some hologram on it showing a nice expanded hollow point. Maybe it's got a bunch of buzzwords on it. Like defense, hollow point, law enforcement. Man stopper. Whatever. That that doesn't make it work. The buzzwords don't make it work. Case in point. I this may shock you. I once didn't it sometimes still do carry a Glock, as much as I rag on Glocks, right? The Briars Vanilla of the handgun world. I I have carried a Glock professionally. I still sometimes do. It's not my general go to. I had a Glock one time. A good Glock is nothing wrong with that particular gun. And I had really good, like one of the go-to law enforcement. I think it might be now one of the go-to FBI loads. And that gun just did not like that ammo. It just did not feed that ammo well. You know how I know? Because I tested it. You can't just assume, oh, I've got a Glock, it'll eat anything. No, no. And some Glocks just don't work well out of the box. You Don't just assume your Glock's going to work because it's a Glock. That's not how that works. Don't just assume that your carry ammo is going to work out of your gun. You have to test that your carry ammo is going to feed out of your gun, is going to work out of your gun. And here's a big one, just like we touched on the rifle. Close enough. And this is even, I see this even more prevalent, I think, in the handgun world. You go out and you train with, let's just say, Winchester White Box again, not because it's bad ammo, because it's very ubiquitous. You go out and train with a 115 grain Winchester White Box. And then you load up some, I'll just use my go to defensive load, 147 grain Winchester Ranger Tees. You see an issue there? Are you just trying to turn money into noise or are you trying to hit a target I'm here to tell you it would be some mathematical anomaly if those 115 grain Winchester white box at let's say 1200 and some feet a second shot the same point of aim point of impact as those 147 grain truncated cone at 900 and some feet a second if they hit the same point of aim point of impact Are you just carrying a gun to feel good because you have a high-capacity loaded gun on your hip? Or you have something in your pocket to make you feel good? Because guns are not security blankies, right? The mere fact that you have one does not make bad guys go away. That's not how that works. I would submit the entire point of firing a gun is to hit a target. How do you know, one, that it will feed in your gun, and two, that it will hit the target? I am not, I am not, I am not telling you to carry 115 grain ball ammunition. What I am saying is if you gave me a choice and I was training and I knew that 115 grain ball was what my gun was sighted in for, it's shot point of aim, point of impact with my sights when fired by me out of my gun, and I knew it very well and I knew it fed in that gun, I would rather get in a shooting with that ammo than with the best, most premium 135 grain plus P FBI load that I had never run in that gun. Because it may not feed. It may not shoot where I'm aiming. So what is the point? Now, again, I'm not telling you to carry ball ammo. I'm telling you to actually train and practice with defensive ammo.
A lot of companies wisely know this and kind of take some of the homework out for you. There is the Spear Lawman and the Spear Gold Dot. The Lawman is the training companion to the defensive load. So you can get their same load like 115 grain Lawman and 115 grain Spear Gold Dots. They have same geometry, same velocity. They're designed to feed the same way. So you could do it that way and that's one of the things that I like to do. Or you can find a load that's similar yourself. Do your homework. Like let's say you decide you're a 124 grain guy. And that's not enough for you. So you want 124 grain plus P. Well a lot of NATO loads. Because the Europeans. Despite what we may think about them being a feminine. They generally load their ammunition hotter. So a general European load or a NATO load. 124 grain is going to be hotter. It's going to be an American plus P load in general. You may find a good affordable practice NATO load, 124 grain, that matches with a good 124 grain plus P defensive load. You have to test that. Don't just assume because, oh, it's 124 grain plus P and the NATO is a plus P and they're both 124 grain. And heck, they're both even made by, I don't know, Winchester. Right? So what? So what? Probably not the same bullet profile. Probably not the same feed characteristics to feed in your gun just because they're both plus p doesn't make them the same velocity probably not using the same powder many other differences you got to test that if you are carrying a gun to prevent loss of life and you haven't tested the ammo in that gun i would really be circumspect and consider that do they feed out of your gun and do they hit where you are aiming at? Probably want to get that data before the peanut butter and chocolate hits the fan. All right, I think that will be a good place to wrap up the ammunition myths for 2023. My tactical tip is actually going to be another myth, ammunition. And I get no sponsors, no kickbacks, none of that. I, I don't take sponsors. I've turned down sponsors on this show because I don't want to take a bribe. You shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Don't think that it's not like one of the big three or big four ammunition companies that you know of in America, like Winchester, Remington, Hornady, Spear. Those are all really good companies. They, in general, make a good product. There are some really garbage companies, in my opinion, for like Wolf and Tula, Brown Bear, Silver Bear, whatever the bear is. But there are some you may not be super familiar with unless you're an uber in the weeds gun guy that are really good ammo in general. And again, that doesn't mean it's going to shoot good out of your gun. You got to test it. You, if that's one thing you take away from this, you got to test it. But Privy Partisan generally makes some pretty good ammo. Fioki might be funny to say, but Fioki makes some good ammo. And Norma, Norma makes some really high end ammo. So don't think that because they're not one of the big ones that they make bad ammo your tactical verse of the day going back to Genesis then God said let us make man in our image according to our likeness let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air over the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so God created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Little pocket sermon here. You are made in the image of God. doesn't say that about any other created thing. You are not a beast of the field. You are not a fish. You are a man made in the image of God called to have dominion. God gave us that liberty and that responsibility to have dominion. That's not a small thing. Be thankful and grateful to the great creator for that. All right, with that gunfighters, get out there, train harder than evil men. Have a blessed day. <laughs>